Okay. Good morning. Um, it's time to begin the second keynote session. Uh, uh, and I am delighted to welcome as our speaker today, David Otter from MIT. Very simply, David is one of the world's great labor economists and is here to enlighten us on, on behalf of the organizers of the conference. We are absolutely delighted, David, that you are here. For the audience, uh, if you don't know David already, he is the Ford Professor of Economics at MIT, Associate Department Head of the Economics Department at MIT, Co-Director of the MIT Task Force on the Work of the Future, Co-Director of the NBER Labor Studies Program. He's worked in a great many areas within labor economics, earnings inequality, human capital, skill demands, technological change, globalization, and others. And uh, he is uh, particularly well known for his work on the tasks model as an approach to labor market analysis. He's going to be speaking to us today on shaping the future of work, lessons from the US experience. Uh, following David's presentation, we should have approximately 15 minutes for questions. So please send them through the chat. David, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you so much for coming. You're muted. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, all right, let's see. So, uh, all right, great. I'm going to share my slides. Let me do that. Um, okay. I'm assuming that that is visible to you. And um, so, first of all, thank you. I'm uh, honored to be invited uh, to speak with you today. And I should uh, qualify that I, I don't consider myself a development economist, so I very much admire the work that you uh, folks do. And so hopefully I can say some things that are relevant from the UX experience uh, that will uh, you know, be constructive for this, uh, for this conference. So um, let me sort of set the stage here about shaping the future of the work. And, and I'm gonna try to sort of combine two things in this talk. One is a kind of, kind of recent research and the other is kind of a, more of a big picture approach uh, that uh, comes from my work leading the MIT Work of the Future Task Force. So we are in an era uh, of grave concern uh, that automation is rendering human labor superfluous. So this is forcefully articulated by Daniel Suskin, the economist from uh, uh, the uh, from Oxford, um, in his 2020 book, A World Without Work. He says uh, machines will not do everything in the future, but they will do more. And as they slowly but relentlessly take on more and more tasks, human beings will be forced to retreat to an ever shrinking set of activities. So sort of a kind of asymptotic uh, task encroachment, if you will. And let me say that this is not an unsophisticated argument. This is not a kind of a lump, or lump of labor fallacy saying, you know, there's only a finite amount of work to do. Rather, this is an argument about comparative advantage. And it, and it goes, it has a distinguished pedigree going back to uh, Vasily Leontiev, who wrote in 1983, Progressive introduction of new computerized automated robot robotized equipment. It's actually an interesting note that people were worried about robots uh, four decades ago. Uh, can be expected to reduce the role of labor, similar to the process by which the introduction of tractors and other machinery first reduced and then completely eliminated horses and other draft animals. So the point here is not that, that we're running out of work, but that people will not be a competitive factor of supply uh, for doing that work. And um, there's a lot of evidence now that automation does erode employment in specific occupations and tasks. So on the left, you see this kind of polarization of employment structure in the United States. Uh, and particularly the hollowing out of middle skilled uh, production, uh, clerical administrative occupations, a lot of that having to do with computerization, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, taking over routine uh, t tasks that can be accomplished by following a set, a set of well understood rules and procedures. If you look on the right, this is the, from the well known paper by Asimo Blue and Restrepo showing a robot exposure at the level of US commuting zones and uh, falling employment to population rates in those heavily robotized areas. Uh, if you look across the OECD, you also see that occupational structure has polarized with the decline in these middle skill routine task intensive activities and growth on the one hand of, you know, high skill professional technical and managerial jobs. And on the other hand, a decline and also excuse, simultaneously, excuse me, growth in many, uh, 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 you know, kind of generic uh, in person service activities that uh, require dexterity, sightedness, common sense, spoken language, but not a lot of formal specialized skills. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of empirical evidence to support this notion of task displacement. 
and uh, and it's been formalized in task models of technological progress, which I've worked on, uh, as others, where you sort of have uh, automation simultaneously substituting some task at, uh, by uh, kind of implication that complements the remainder. And in this set of way of thinking about things, machines have an expanding comparative advantage in a set of activities. And so they, this, you know, kind of encapsulating Suskin's idea, they kind of, you know, people are pushed to the edges. Doesn't mean they run out of work to do, but they are doing a narrower set of activities. But of course, this is really not the whole story. Um, we understand intuitively uh, that technologies augment as well as automate. Uh, so just to give you some examples, you know, uh, this is a, uh, as many will know, a pneumatic nail gun. If you're a roofer, this enables you to do uh, much more rapid and potentially more complex work uh, in a short order. Um, or if you are in the field of medicine, uh, we have an incredible set of diagnostic tools. And uh, what I want to emphasize is these don't replace or make medical expertise less necessary. They actually, Im you know, improve the range of, uh, uh, you know, the accuracy of diagnosis, the set of things that one can treat, and also demand all kinds of expertise in the actual process of, uh, of, of using a diagnosis. Or uh, if you are an architect or a designer, uh, you know, rendering tools and drafting engineering tools, you know, not only do they you know, kind of speed up your work and save some of the, the tasks that you do, but they enable greater creativity for people to engineer and design things that would actually be incalculable and feasible and to uh, and to work through ideas in a more uh, fluid form. Um, or if you're an educator, uh, you know, automation or not automation, but computerization technologies, they expand your reach. They allow you hopefully to inter not only interact with more students, but provide better, more engaging, more accessible content. And they demand a different skill set. Uh, someone who's a really great online a uh, speaker MOOC presenter is probably uh, not the same person who's uh, who's a great one-on-one -on -one classroom teacher, or uh, who certainly requires an additional set of skills. Or uh, even if you are an independent driver, uh, you know, software and tools and GPS allow you to compete with UPS in some sense by uh, never having by having your own effectively your own cloud-based route planning system. So what I want to emphasize in all these examples is that. We tend to think of the ways, or at least I think Westerners, people in rich countries worrying about these topics, tend to think of all the ways that computers or automation is substituting us, substituting for us. But we, it's easy to neglect all the ways that these tools complement us. They make us better. And it's not simply that they allow us to do the same things more efficiently. They actually demand new skill sets, online teaching, diagnostic tools, architecture and rendering, even, you know, uh, transportation and logistics. So they augment our skills and demand new expertise. They create, in some sense, new types of work that didn't previously exist. And that's what I want to talk about today, the emergence of new work. Um, this idea, the for, sort of the idea uh, formalized empirically, uh, a paper by Jeffrey Lin, who's an economist at the Philadelphia Fed, um, uh, you know, was the first one to really try to measure new work. And I'm going to build on his approach in this, this work, and, this would, uh, and I'll describe, mention my co-authors in a minute. Um, and he uses census historical documents over three decades, between 1970 to 2000, and says, look, hey, the set of tasks that people are doing, it's not fixed or static. There are new things that are showing up. And you can see these in, uh, in actual government documents, and I'll tell you how in a minute. Um, and this notion of new work, you know, uh, my co-author Jonas Moglu and uh, uh, Pasquale Restrepo, one of our MIT students and frequent co-author Duran, and someone I'm working with as well, um, they sort of take this idea of new work and they sort of bring it into the task model, task model that I've uh, helped contribute to. Uh, and in that task model, you can think of kind of uh, automation as uh, substituting a set of tasks, set of work activities from uh, people to machines. And then uh, new task creation, what they call reinstatement, is the kind of countervailing process, which restores human comparative advantage um, by creating a new set of things that people uh, do that are not yet done by machines. And so you can sort of think of this r race between task displacement and new task creation uh, as uh, kind of simultaneously erasing some work and creating some new work. Doesn't, there's nothing about that guarantees this will, will happen at equal rates, um, but the potential is there. And then they provide some proxies for that and, and provide some evidence on that. 
And uh, there's an, a bunch of related work I want to mention that looks at task change over time within occupations. There's a great paper, uh, a 2019 paper that has uh, using data from 1899, which just which uh, where the Bureau of Labor Statistics looked at um, the uh, cobbling occupation or the making of boots and compared task by task the kind of um, uh, assembly line version versus the artisanal version and all the new work and all that was created and all the old work that disappeared. Um, but there's really limited new evidence, limited representative new evidence on the evolution of of new work. Uh, where does it come from? What's it made of? Uh, how important is it? So um, that's the goal of the uh, the re research I've been doing that I will describe. Um, so uh, new work, where does it come from? What's it made up of? So the goals of this research, um, which are joint, the little asterisk will appear at the bottom with uh, Anas, uh, Anna Salamans, who's a professor at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and Brian Segmeller, who's a PhD student at the MIT Sloan School, tries to first consistently measure the kind of the content of new work over eight decades in the United States. Uh, second, we want to explore its technological and economic origins. By technological, I mean its relationship to innovation. By economic, I mean its relationship to incentives. Obviously, innovation responds to incentives as well. Let's talk about that more a little bit uh, as we go. Third, I want to uh, analyze its relationship to new labor demand. So how does new work affect, relate to the quantity of work? Does it, is it just new titles or does it actually uh, shape the overall direction and extent of labor demand? And finally, I wanna zoom out and consider the implications of new work for how we shape the future of work. And again, I just wanna emphasize at the bottom of the slide that the, the, you know, these first uh, three bullets here are based on this uh, working paper with, uh, with Anna and Brian. So how do we know that new work is quantitatively important? You may be thinking, okay, is this just a gimmick? Who cares? So here, and I'll begin to show a number of figures like this as the talk goes on. This shows the, you the distribution of employment in 1940 in the United States across 12 exhaustive and mutually exclusive occupations that uh, are ranked roughly from lowest to highest paid. So you can see uh, the largest two categories here are agriculture, farming and mining, and production work. And they comprise about 40% of the 50 million jobs uh, that were uh, measured by the U.S. Census at that time. This figure shows you the distribution of employment in uh, 2018. And uh, you can, uh, so the, the height of the red and green bars is overall employment. So you can see, for example, agriculture is now in, in absolute numbers, much, much smaller than it was in 1940, despite the tripling of the workforce. And uh, we see a lot of new work uh, or sorry, more work in professional, managerial, technical work, for example, also in office work and some in personal services. But now what I've done is the height of the red and green bars break these jobs into uh, the green being uh, occupation titles that existed in 1940 and the red being things that have been added in the intervening 80 years. And when I say added, I'll explain what I mean formally, but these are effectively new uh, detailed occupations, not the ones you would see in public use data, uh, that were not present 80 years ago. So about two thirds of all employment in 2018 is now found in jobs that really sort of hadn't been invented as of 1940. And, um, and of course, the jobs that have grown the most are the ones that have seen the most new, uh, uh, creation of new types of work. So just like to give you a tiny concrete example of this, just so you have in mind, uh, what what I'm going to fill in a minute, um, the uh, the the Census Bureau creates these these lists of titles. I'll explain uh, that are used for as a coding guide for uh, for putting together the public use data or for the data that the Census Bureau actually uses itself. And so, for example, in 1939, there were about 83 tiny occupations uh, in uh, auto repair. Uh, by 2018, there were 143 such occupations, many of them uh, were uh, in doing tasks that couldn't have been done in 1939 because the technologies didn't exist. So for example, uh, there are multiple types of air conditioning, auto air conditioning repair or fuel injection repair or disc brakes. None of those technologies were present in 1940 automobiles. Um, but all of those new tasks are associated uh, with uh, new capabilities, new things that have been invented uh, in, th in their intervening 80 years. So we can see that quantitatively new work appears to be important. So um, in the paper, we kind of formally hypothesize two distinct set of forces 
that are contributing to the evolution of new work. One is technological. We distinguish between task augmentation and task automation, as I, as I tried to motivate in my introduction there. Um, so augmentation complements labor's outputs. It, it fosters specialization. It demands new expertise. And that's a lot of really what I want you to have in mind when we think about the evolution of new work. Conversely, automation substitutes for labor's input. So I, I'm making this key distinction between complementing outputs versus substituting inputs, and I'll come back to that many times. Uh, simultaneously, that's not, it's not all technology. Uh, demand or market scale changes also will spur or inhibit specialization. So outward shifts in occupational demand will accelerate the emergence of new types of work. And inward shifts in occupational demand, they won't destroy types of work, but they will slow the emergence, uh, this evolutionary process. And, and our framework predicts, and I'll show you uh, the evidence of this, that task automation and task augmentation are positively correlated. They happen at the same place and same occupation simultaneously, but they have countervailing relationships to occupational labor demand. Um, they have different effects and that augmentation is uh, actually is creating new work, is increasing the value of labor and automation is doing the opposite. And so you can see both of them uh, working together simultaneously, in fact, responding to the same forces. So let me outline the rest of, of my uh, remarks. So uh, first I'm gonna tell you how we measure new work and there's gonna be some detail here. Hopefully this is of independent interest and I think the tools that we're using here uh, can be uh, used by others and we're, we're proud of them. And a lot of the credit goes to uh, my co-author, Brian Segmiller, who's a PhD student at MIT. Then I'm gonna talk about, oops, excuse me, testing some hi hypotheses about new work and in particular describing the relationship to how we can see new work working and why it's important. And I'll, I'll talk about these specifically. I won't read them out loud now. And then I want to step back and talk about shaping the future work and some lessons from the U.S. experience and from the, from the task force that I uh, led and how it relates to this general phenomenon of the creation of work. And then I'll conclude. So first, I want to talk about how we actually measure new work, and then I'll elaborate these figures I've been giving. I haven't really told you what's in them. And there are really three major sources that I'm going to describe next. One is a kind of a catalog of tasks, what we call micro titles, that enter the U.S. census over eight decades. Uh, the second is technologies or innovations that complement occupational outputs, what we call augmentation innovations. And the third is technologies that substitute for occupational inputs, what we call automation innovations. And I think a, a valuable contribution to the paper is that we're going to be able to try to extract those different types, those different dimensions of innovation from the same corpus of information, which is uh, the corpus of all the U.S. utility patents from 1930 to present. Um, but we're going to use different techniques for getting at those different dimensions. So a lot of what we're going to do, you can sort of see it in this figure. <laughs> so let me just familiarize you. Uh, we have three, um, three things that we're trying to extract. One is new, these new occupational titles, and those give us our measure of new work. The second is what we're going to call augmentation patents that, uh, that complement labor's outputs. And the third is what we call automation patents that uh, substitute for labor's inputs. We're going to try to build these three databases and then put them together with representative U.S. employment data to ask about the emergence of new titles and finally uh, changes in the quantity of work across occupations. So first, let me talk about new titles. Where do these actually come from? So the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Census Bureau creates an alphabetical index of occupations and industries each decade. They've been doing this uh, since 1900. Or the first volume was published in 1915, but it referred to 1900. And, um, the reason they do this is because on your census form, they ask you to say what you do. What is your occupation? What is your industry? There's not a bubble to fill in. That's a free text form. And that means that uh, Census Bureau employees must take what you do, uh, what you write in, what you describe, and, and uh, classify it to a, uh, a formal one of their, you know, between 250 and 400 or 500 occupations that they have in each decade. The number changes. So this is actually a coding aid for Census Bureau employees. So for example, here are some examples just within the health technologists and technicians, not elsewhere classified occupation. I should, uh, there are about 30, 35,000 titles in 1990. Here's some very, some examples, artificial limb fitter, brainwave technician, extracorporeal circulation specialist, ocular care technician, surgical brace maker. Right? So these are extremely detailed things that someone would write in. They're, um, uh, they're not what you would find in, in the census data. The Census Bureau doesn't actually save 
this information. It's just what it uses to as a coding aid. And each title is classified to a census occupation. And so what we do is we compare successive editions of the census alphabetical index of occupations to identify these new titles as they appear. And I should say this is, was Jeffrey Lin's idea. We're building on that idea. We're doing it at scale. <laughs> uh, and we have a, a, a set of uh, a pretty rigorous techniques for doing that. There's obviously it's not as simple simply looking for textual changes because there are changes in uh, grammar changes. Uh, you know, they add and remove uh, gender information and so on. So it, it requires a bunch of work. Um, that's how we identify new titles. So just let me give you some examples of titles added. So on the left hand side, um, you see um, uh, a bunch of uh, titles that obviously involve expertise in technology. So automatic welding machine operator, textile chemist, uh, controller remote remotely piloted vehicles, artificial intelligence specialist, pediatric vascular surgeons. And next to each of these is the date that it appeared in the census alphabetical index. And I want you to notice, by the way, that these are these are actually pretty, they, they picked these things up earlier, early. So a control of a remotely piloted vehicle, that's in 1980. Artificial intelligence specialist in 2000 is relatively sensitive. Uh, the Census Bureau notices these things and adds them to the index. Here are some others that are added. Acrobatic dancer, pageant director, hypnotherapist, amusement park worker, a drama therapist, sommelier. <laughs> now, of course, sommeliers have been around for centuries, at least as long as the Republic of France, but uh, they weren't, there weren't enough in the United States for them to, you know, uh, be picked up specifically by the Census Bureau. And what I want to emphasize on the right is um, there are at least as many, arguably more examples of the of the type on the right than on the left. Um, many of these have to do not with technology per se, but with changes in income, changes in tastes, and changes in demographics that affect the type of entertainment, the type of health care, uh, the type of uh, uh, expenditure that people engage in. And so they're really two things that, as I emphasized earlier, that are going to be important here. One is the technological change and the other is the demographics themselves. Um, we measure uh, new work since it's not recorded in the Census Bureau who's doing which of these titles in the census data. We just look at new work as the flow as the flow of new titles within a census macro occupation over all titles or simply the count of new titles emerging, for example. So that's how we measure new work. Now we want to measure the innovations that may potentially augment or automate that work. To do that, we're going to use two corpora of texts uh, to, to identify the information, uh, uh, one for augmentation and one for automation. So for augmentation, we're again going to draw on the census index of occupations also for, uh, there's similar for industries, and we're going to use the description, the, the Bought the bunch of words, the corpus of words around each occupation to think of a description of its outputs. So, for example, with health technologists, right, you can see ambulance driver, uh, anesthesiologist, audiometrist, uh, biochemist, uh, mechanic, uh, ocular care technician, and so on. And we think of these things as describing the set of activities that an occupation produces, not the work that people do per se, but the things they are making. And on the right hand side, for our measure of inputs, we're going to use the dictionary of occupational titles that actually describes the work that people do within that occupation. So here's our health technologist again. They perform laboratory tests, uh, they conduct chemical analyses, they study blood cells, uh, and they analyze test results. And so roughly the things on the right describe the work that people do, the things on the left describe the outputs that they create. Uh, and so what we're going to do, how are we going to use those? We're, we're going to take these uh, uh, three, these three sets of inputs. One is the description of outputs. The other is the description of inputs. And the third is the complete corpus of U.S. utility patents over this period from 1930 to 2018. Um, we're going to then use some natural language processing tools. So we're going to extract vectors of word embeddings. These are basically geometric representations of the meanings of words. So uh, you know, two colors will be closer in vector space than will be, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a blender and a and a you know a bed frame, and um, we're going to uh, uh, essentially boil down the description of each occupation uh, in terms of what it does and what inputs it uses, and then each patent into these um, weighted vectors uh, describing their content. Then we're going to look for similarity uh, between these different corpora. So in particular, we're going to take the patent corpus, which we clean, and we're going to tart and say, what is the overlap 
with these descriptions of occupational outputs. And similarly, we're going to say, what is its overlap with the description of occupational inputs? And then we're going to put those things together to come up with the, a measure of the degree to which ma each macro occupation is exposed to augmentation, these patents that relate to its outputs. And on the other hand, its exposure to automation, these patents that relate to its inputs. And what I want to emphasize here is this procedure we are uh, is completely parallel. We are doing exactly the same thing to get automation and augmentation exposure. The only difference between them is the corpora of text that we use to identify those things. They use the same patents, they use the same natural language processing procedures, but for augmentation, we're targeting these descriptions of outputs, and for automation, we're targeting these descriptions of inputs. And let me clear up, there's overlap between these things. So the proof here really is in the pudding, uh, whether this generates meaningful and distinct information. So, um, uh, at the level of occupations, what we see is that automation and augmentation are strongly positively correlated, as our model would predict. So, childcare workers don't have much of either. Uh, assemblers of electrical equipment have a lot of both. But there are also things that are on the off diagonal. So, for example, typesetters and compositors, or elevator installers, or uh, cabinet bench makers are exposed to a lot of automation without a lot of patents that appear to be augmenting the value of what they produce. Uh, operating operations system research analysts, uh, business promotion agents don't is, is appear to be subject to that much automation, but appear to be subject to a lot of augmentation. And so these off diagonal examples are important because we're going to expect things like this to contract and things like this to grow if these are really countervailing forces. Okay. So, um, let me, uh, the, um, Let's see. So, okay, great. So now let me kind of walk you through quickly uh, a set of summary results and then, and then draw the big picture. So we test hypotheses about new work and I'll present evidence on these very briefly. One is that augmentation technologies, innovation spur the creation of new job tasks, whereas automation does not. The second is not, it's not just technologies, but also changes in labor demand also affect the creation of new work. And I'll show you that. And then. Uh, those are really description of new tasks. And then what we want to show, what we, what we find is that these actually affect the net amount of employment within occupations, where we see a lot of augmentation ago occurring, we see employment growing, where we see a lot of automation occurring, we see employment contracting. And so then I want to summarize that and then step back further. So here we go. Um, so the first thing we want to ask is, well, do automation technologies spur new tasks? So what we're going to do is we're going to look in occupations over by decade. We're going to look at the emergence of new titles. And we're going to relate them to these measures of the flow of augmentation patents. And I'll, I'll try to do this mostly in pictures, so I won't do this in regressions if where I can avoid it. This figure shows you a kind of a key result. Uh, these are those 12 occupations I discussed initially from agriculture uh, on the top left to managers and executives on, on the bottom right. On the x-axis is the percentile of uh, augmentation patents uh, in each of two periods, 1940-1980, 1990-2018. On the y-axis is the emergence of the count of new titles, again in percentiles. And you can see in essentially 24 or 24 cases, we see this very striking, very clear, you know, doesn't require a regression to see it, adjust a relationship that where new augmentation patents are occurring. Um, that's where uh, new occupations are emerging, right? So these things are co-occurring, uh, co um, and this is true in all occupations, broad occupational categories. This is true in all time periods, right? These things are uh, are clearly predictive of one another. That doesn't make a causal statement. It just says that where there's a lot of new innovation occurring, um, we see uh, a lot of new types of human work uh, being introduced. Now, um, you might say, okay, well, you know, you've said augmentation, augmentation, but, you know, maybe it's just all patents. Wherever there's new patents, there's new types of work. So what we try to do is we try to distinguish those. For here, for this next thing, I'm just going to focus on the last four decades. We haven't finished the first four. <laughs> um, and let me show you. So here we have the relationship between the emergence of new titles and the introduction of augmentation patents. And let me just interpret that coefficient for you. It says for about a 10% increase 
in aug the introduction of augmentation patents, you see about a one and a half percent increase uh, in the in the introduction of new occupational titles. Now we do the same thing for automation patents. Now if I just put them in one on their own, you would see, oh, well, look, those are also positively predictive. Automation also predicts the emergence of new titles. But of course, I've already told you that these two things, augmentation and automation, are highly positively correlated. When I control for augmentation, we no longer see this relationship. In other words, there really does seem to be a difference among these types of innovations with the, the augmentation ones predicting the emergence of new types of human work and automation not predicting the introduction of new work. It's not, you know, we don't see, we don't see titles being eliminated. That's actually not something our data can capture, but we see, we don't see new things being created where a lot of automation is going on. And the, I should say these are occurring in the same places. So this is an important kind of statistical uh, uh, ability to distinguish these things. I think it's conceptually and, and uh, economically important. Okay. As I said, uh, er, initially, um, it's not just about technology. It's a mistake to think that technology is the only relevant factor here. Um, we, so we also hypothesize just wherever there is the emergence of new demand, you are going to endogenously see this pro process of new types of specialization, development of new expertise, wherever the market size grows, wherever there's, uh, there's money, <laughs> uh, people will invent and specialize. And the way we test that, we test that in a couple of different ways in the paper, but uh, the main thing we do, the one I want to focus on is we actually use a negative demand shock to the United States. We use the China trade shock and look at the exposure of different occupations to that shock. So let me show you pictorially what this does. So this measures occupations exposure to the China trade shock, the demand contraction following from China's rising uh, comparative advantage in many labor intensive manufactured goods. Uh, we trace those effects to occupations. Here are occupations, major occupational categories ranked by their exposure, health services, personal services, farming, mining, all the way up to construction and production. The black dots is the mean exposure of an occupation, of the major occupation. And then the blue dots are the most and least exposed within that. So for example, among production workers, the most exposed production workers to China trade shock were textile sewing machine operators. The least exposed are power plant operators. Makes a lot of sense. If we look in transportation, Machine feeders and off-bearers were the most exposed, bus drivers the least exposed. Um, if we look in technicians, programmers of, of numerically controlled machines were most exposed, sheriffs and bailiffs were least exposed. So our test essentially compares within each of these major occupations, whether uh, how exposure to China trade shock affects new emergence of new tasks, new titles within these narrower categories. So let me show you uh, statistically what this says. So the dependent variable here is the emergence of new titles uh, between uh, 1990 and 2018. Um, here's our measure of import exposure. Here's our measure of augmentation. Notice that remains highly predictive and significant. There's lots of new innovation associated with these augmentation patterns. But you can see that the more exposed an occupation is to the China trade shock, the fewer new types of work are being introduced. So it's not just that there's less, fewer jobs there's less new types of things to do, less uh, fewer opportunities for specialization, for the demand for new expertise. Uh, and that's true when we ac ac account for these broad occupation fixed effects for exposure to manufacturing and so on. Then you might say, oh, well, you know, maybe this has always been true. Maybe it's just endemic to kind of manufacturing occupations. But if you do the same exercise uh, two decades earlier before the China trade shock, you do not see this relationship. So it's clear that this demand force itself changes opportunities for specialization, the creation of new uh, labor demanding activities. Um, and I should say that, and I, I don't have time to, to, to uh, draw this out, so, so I won't, but let me uh, just mention, we use two different forces, types of demand, uh, uh, I, I, sources of demand change in the paper, one having to do with this technological change of augmentation and the other having to do with demographic shifts coming from kind of changes in the age structure of the US population. And they have very different, uh, uh, they make very different predictions about where we would see new work emerging. So for example, if you look up here, these are occupations that are exposed to a lot of positive demographic demand shifts, but not much uh, uh, augmentation, right? So uh, kindergarten teachers, uh, you know, real estate sales occupations, uh, waiters and waitresses and housekeepers and then funeral directors. So you have like, your whole life cycle events there, you know, uh, you send your kid to school, you buy a house, 
uh, you go out to dinner and then somebody dies. Um, and, uh, and so we use both sources of variation and uh, show that they independently tell us where new work will emerge. And in the case of demand contractions, where it will not emerge as well. And so I want to emphasize that, you know, this is not a simple technological determinism story. In fact, of course, the innovations themselves respond to these demand shifts. Okay, so final empirical piece on this. Um, so uh, I've told you about the emergence of new work as described by new job titles, but you really ultimately care about not the titles, but the work itself, how much work is being created. And so for that, uh, so let me just say uh, descriptively, where we see new titles emerging, we see lots of new work, we see lots of work growing. And these are not just in technical occupations, as I mentioned, it's not just computer scientists uh, and software developers, but also uh, vocational educational counselors, uh, registered nurses, child care workers, uh, stock inventory servers, uh, clerks and office supervisors, or on the negative side, printing machine operators, uh, bank tellers, uh, laundry and dry cleaning workers. So as we move rightward, we see a lot of new titles emerging and a lot of new employment emerging. And as we move leftward, we see very little of this new activity and very little new employment. But of course, that's just a uh, uh, that could easily be uh, somewhat um, mechanical. And so what we try to do is relate the changes in employment directly to these types of innovations that we can measure, both to augmentation and automation. And I should say that there are papers that look at this exact question of changes in employment with occupations, relating them to automation. A uh, paper by Kogan et al., where one of the et al. is Brian Sigmel, our co-author, a <laughs> uh, paper by Michael Webb. So the key addition we're making is this measure of exposure to augmentation, this notion of using patents, not just to measure what's being automated away, but what's potentially being augmented. And let me just show you pictorially what we find. So on the x-axis here is uh, exposure and occupation to augmentation patents, holding automation fixed, and things that are being augmented, in fact, are growing. Things that are, we see where we see new innovations occurring, those are things that are growing. Uh, on the right hand side is automation patents holding augmentation fixed and there we see things that are exposed to a lot of automation are contracting so simultaneously the um these things are working in countervailing directions within occupations they really do seem to be in a kind of a a a race uh, where the, they're working at uh, in on uh, countervailing margins i should also say we do a, a, more, a broader exercise where we look not just at employment but at wages and show that these really are net labor demand changes. It's not that they're growing, but wages are falling, adjusting for composition. Uh, it's uh, we're seeing overall outward movements in demand where there's a lot of augmentation occurring and inward movements in demand uh, where there's a lot of automation occurring. Okay, so let me summarize and then and then step back. So, um, you know, on the kind of this, you know, we've been trying to shed some light on the what we think of the dark matter of the task universe, this kind of notion of work, it, it's quantitatively important. And we're not the first people to say that. Um, a lot of the employment that we're, work that we're doing now is coming, uh, is, is work that we did, weren't doing uh, 80 years ago. Um, we can see that technological change predicts where this new work emerges. New titles emerge where innovations complements labor's outputs, and they don't emerge where innovation automates labor's inputs. And so we can we can empirically distinguish those in a kind of hands-off, but we think uh, 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 effective way. Um, technological change is only part of the new work story. Uh, new work is driven by taste, by wealth, by demographics, by globalization. Its emergence accelerates with outward demand shifts, slows with inward demand shifts. And finally, it doesn't, it's not just about titles, it predicts network creation. Employment grows in occupations that are exposed to augmentation and shrinks in occupations exposed to automation innovations. Okay, so that's the sort of just summarizing the results. So now let me say, well, what lessons do I draw from this and that I hope you can draw from this? Um, so uh, let me kind of make these, uh, I really wanna make four points. One is about technological change broadly. The second is about how we shape that technological change. Third, I want to give you a recent example of this. And fourth, I want to talk about the institutional forces, again, very briefly. So uh, uh, as Gary mentioned, I was for two, two and a half years, was co-director of the MIT Task Force on the Work of the Future uh, with uh, my colleagues David Mendel and Elizabeth Reynolds. And this is our final report, uh, Building Better Jobs in the Age of Intelligent Machine. We spent a lot of time looking at various technologies as well as economics of them, autonomous vehicles, industrial robotics, intelligent supply chains, additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence. And um, a couple of key points really emerged from this. The first is that 
these are momentous technological changes. They are going to change the way we work and what work we do, how we do it. Um, but they're unfolding gradually. They are not overnight, uh, you know, upheavals. All the and the reason in most cases is that they take huge infrastructural changes, regulatory changes, uh, replacement of existing capital, and tremendous refinement. And so they are going to be extremely important. But you know, as you know, it's it's been famously said that we overestimate the importance of technologies in the short run and underestimate them in the long run. And it's easy to do that with all of these because, of course, autonomous vehicles have been something of a flop. They will eventually be incredibly important. So these are moving. Um, but they're and they're momentously important, but they're like icebergs. They're not like uh, they're not like uh, gunshots. Um, the second is that they um, they affect the type of work we do. The third point is that we shape these things. They don't appear on their own. They are things that we choose to invest in, and uh, and um, and so they, in some sense, should be understood to be a part of a decision, a societal decision making process, an economic process that we have shaped and that we will shape going forward, whether we are aware of it or not. So, so drawing that lesson out, the jobs that we get depend a lot on the investments that we make. So this figure, which is adopted from a recently published paper by Kelly et al, shows you the changing locus of innovation over 120 years. They group patents into these 10 major technology classes. And this is a kind of a stacked area graph. And you can see in here kind of three time periods, three epochs, one being the machine age, another being a kind of chemical and metal age, and a third being an uh, information and, he and health age. So I put on the left the ones that tend to be contracting over time, the ones on the right that tend to be growing. So you can see in the first part of this period, transportation, manufacturing, engineering, construction, mining, this is where all the new in innovation was occurring. As we get to after the 1940s, we kind of move into an age of where there's a lot of chemistry and metallurgy. You might think of this as the era of better living through chemistry. And then from 1980 forward, we move very clearly into the information age. Almost all the innovations are occurring in instruments and information, in health, electricity, and electronics. Well, those are not, of course, uh, exogenous processes. Those respond uh, both to the technologies, but also to the war, uh, to the investments the government makes, and so on. But they matter for work. Um, you can see which occupations are exposed to innovation changing over time. Uh, so in the last century, the importance of innovation for professional, technical, and managerial work, for health service work, for sales and clerical administrative work has accelerated, and those for transportation and production and agriculture mining have declined. So as we change where we innovate, we also change the type of new work that we do. And you can see this, for example, if you look at the distribution of new work by education level. So if we look at high school graduates, between 1940 and 1980, you can see that a lot of the new work that was created was in the middle of the distribution, in construction, transportation, production, clerical admin, and sales. If we look at the last four decades, it's much more on the left side of this figure in health services, personal service, and cleaning and protective service, and most of the new work is not occurring in these middle skill occupations. That reflects a change in where we're investing and what type of innovations we're doing. Um, and, uh, and of course, it matters for the type of work that uh, people without college educations are now asked to do. If we do the same exercise for people with high educations, we can see that the work is actually getting more specialized over time, moving to technician, professional, and managerial, and in fact, even moving out of clerical administrative support. So this polarization in the evolution of new work uh, shapes the type of jobs that we create going forward. David, excuse me, I just wanted to uh, give you a heads up five more minutes, please. Yep, yep, um, I'll be done. I'll be done speaking less than that. Um, so just to give you a concrete example of this, um, who will work from home after the pandemic, right? Well, here I'm referring to the work of Barraro, Bloom, and Davis. Uh, if you look by education, by earnings levels, everybody, these black dots, uh, would like to be working a couple days a week from home uh, when the pandemic is over, if it's ever over. Uh, here, the orange triangles are what employers plan. You can see employers plan for high wage workers to work from home, but not for low wage workers. Similarly, you say, we are, what else are employers planning? Well, workers who work in dense urban areas, employers are planning for them to do a lot of their work from home. People who work in low density areas, not so much. And that's not surprising. So it says high paid workers, many of them uh, knowledge workers, working in expensive locations will now be working more from home. 
Okay, why does that matter? Well, here I refer to another paper by Bloom Davis and here and Zetskova. Here they look at patent applications involving work from home technologies. And you can see that those rise from about a half percent of all patents to about 1.2% of patents in just the first six months of 2020. So innovation shifts in response to changing demand. And what is that going to do? Well, clearly that's gonna, those patents are directed to augmenting the productivity and convenience and comfort of people working from home, right? So this technological response, responding to demand changes, will change the locus of, of new work creation. In fact, whose productivity and skills are complemented. Okay, um, so you can see the interaction between demand and technology and the type of work. And, and let me end on a final point, which is that, of course, you know, I've talked a lot about jobs, but jobs are not enough and institutional forces uh, are going to matter, do matter enormously. So if we look, for example, across OECD countries over the last 20 years, we can see that in most countries, there's been a kind of a divergence between the med media, the growth, the evolution of median wages and mean wages with the median falling relative to the mean, which means, of course, the distribution has become more right shifted, it's become more unequal, but specifically uh, with more of the mass at the top. This has happened to varying degrees, but much more in some countries than others. Uh, the US stands out, as does uh, the UK. Uh, if we look at France, very little of that has occurred. So all countries are sort of facing these uh, kind of, you know, these disequalizing forces, but the degree to which they have played out uh, is, is, uh, is influenced a lot uh, by uh, policies within countries. The US is kind of the most egregious example. Over the last 40 years, the gap between productivity and average hourly wages, and even so more so between average hourly wages and median wages has just expanded. And uh, yeah. this reflects a number of forces, but I would say many of them uh, institutional. Uh, you can also see this if you compare the earnings of low skill workers uh, in the US and the OECD, for example, here's the US, here's our neighbor to North Canada, where people are making one third more per hour, doing very, very similar work. So what I want to, the point I'm, I want to underscore here is, I don't want to tell a deterministic story. I don't want to suggest that these, uh, that these innovations and demand shifts necessarily, they affect the type of work we're doing, but the, the, the way that the structured and compensated is heavily influenced by policy. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's uh, and there's a lot of scope for choice. It's something we really emphasize in our task force report. Countries that have pushed back against inequality, uh, measured as this Gini coefficient, um, don't seem to pay a price in lower dynamism. Uh, if you think of dynam if you think of dynamism as reflected kind of uh, economic mobility, countries that have lower levels of inequality appear to have more mobility. Countries that are more unequal at a point in time also tend to be more dynastic, meaning that. Uh, the, the outcomes of children are much more predictable from the inputs of parents. So and it's important to emphasize that we have institutional choice, trade-offs to make, and not all of them are painful trade-offs. <laughs> Many of them uh, appear to be trade-offs where we're just be operating behind the frontier. So let me kind of conclude, and then I, I look forward to questions, and I, I uh, thank you for all of your interest. So. Um, there's a palpable fear in many places and something what uh, motivates our work between of the future. And we would say that's, that's a consequence of this divergence between innovation and labor market opportunity that we've seen over the last four decades, a lot of productivity growth and a lot of new work created, but is the fruit, the benefits of that have been extremely unequally shared. Um, these consequences are not intrinsic. Uh, they reflect institutional choices and we can make different and hopefully better choices. Um, I think one should reject this specious trade-off between economic growth and strong labor markets. You as development economists, of course, have heard this for decades. Uh, these are complements, not substitutes. Uh, the labor market, uh, well-functioning labor markets and good opportunities for workers are kind of uh, key to uh, both economic and political health. The majority of today's jobs uh, had yet to be invented a century ago. Um, these inventions that occurred were not accidental. They reflect demand forces and purposeful innovations, choices about where to invest, where to innovate, uh, what to focus on. We are similarly choosing our own future at the present. We, will, we are making these same choices about investment and incentives that will shape the type of work we do over the next uh, century. So we 
collectively should invest in a future that is one that we ourselves want ourselves and our children to inhabit. And so the bottom line of the discussion of shaping future work is we have agency. It's not an inevitable set of outcomes, but one that we can see the economic incentive forces uh, working to create. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you uh, very much. Hey, David, thank you. thank you so much. Uh, are, are people hearing me? Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes, okay, good. So a few questions have come, come in. Uh, I want to uh, go back to something that you said at the very beginning, uh, and that is uh, the question of whether uh, uh, developing countries in particular have lost compet uh, comparative advantage so that their workers are no longer competitive inputs in um, the global economy. I wonder what your view is on that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have that concern, but I don't think the evidence strongly supports this, right? So first of all, a lot of the economic growth over the last uh, 30 years has been in low and middle income countries not in uh, the rich world, right? So China, but also not China, exclusively China, Central America, and even Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, I don't think, and in fact, a lot of the, the growth of trade has been uh, among middle and low income countries. So there is, you know, there's a pervasive fear that, you know, we're entering in a period in which robots will make, uh, you know, uh, you know, less educated labor superfluous and, and things will all be reshored to high income countries. But so far, we're not seeing that. And, uh, and so I think it's a theoretical possibility, but just as possible is that many of these technologies will enable countries to, on the one hand, you know, produce a better quality of life for their citizens by, you know, productive efficiencies, uh, better uses of resources, uh, and better information systems. And uh, also potentially to uh, use those technologies to, you know, make uh, high quality goods and export them. Um, the fact that you could do it in the U.S. with a robot doesn't mean you can't do it uh, in India with a robot or do it in Kenya with a robot, so on. It doesn't have to be localized. Um, now, of course, these technologies could be misused. I'm not uh, saying that this is inevitable. And, of course, they could be used for, you know, monitoring and surveillance and so social control and all kinds of things. So I, I, I'm not uh, operating, offering a Pollyannish viewpoint, but I, I do think the um, – there's, I don't see, I hear the concern, but don't see the evidence that suggests that these, uh, that these technologies have eroded the comparative advantage of the developing world. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two questions that are very closely related. Uh, let me paraphrase the two of them. Um, can public policy influence the composition of technological progress in terms of augmentation and automation? Do we have tools to accelerate augmentation at all, or should we focus on policies to compensate for changes in the structure of innovation. And uh, another questioner has asked what institutional changes, uh, choices in labor markets could make augmentation and inequality reduction go hand in hand? Yeah, great questions. So, first of all, I do think we have institutional choices. And I think, you know, it's easier, obviously, in the uh, rich world where a lot of the R&D is being done to kind of, you know, say this, but, uh, you know, certainly if you look at the shape of innovation that I showed you from the United States over the last 120 years, you can see eras of government investment and choices about focus on military technologies, on information technologies, on health technologies. And so governments play a very large role in directing technical change, both directly through what they buy, but also through what they fund universities to do, and even how they regulate. Uh, what they want corporations to do. We can see, of course, happening very aggressively in real time in China. Um, uh, in addition, uh, we also provide incentives that live not just at the regulatory level or even federal government investment level, but even in the tax code, right? Our tax code in the United States heavily favors automation. If you want to buy a new machine, the government will go in on with you and help you expense it rapidly. But if you want to use labor for that purpose, uh, you will not get a similar subsidy. We, sub we, we do a lot of subsidizing of capital investment at the expense of labor, arguably uh, inefficiently so. So that can also change. And then uh, a third point is it's not just the technology that occurs. Almost in any sector where we see new d demand creation occurring, sort of you see the process of complementarity of, of new work innovation kind of emerging endogenously whether if you're if you're just doing a lot of manufacturing you will get a lot of 
manufacturing innovation and new specialization. If you do a lot of public works projects or solar installation, you will see specialized specialization occurring around those. So I don't think it's it's only kind of we should think this is all lab science. A lot of it occurs, you know, locally in the field, and uh, you know, a lot of the uh, innovations, for example, we've seen in e-commerce or in banking or in even. Um, you know, uh, providing uh, on demand services has it happened in the developing world, not in the rich world uh, as a uh, function of specialized needs of particular needs that need to be filled there and the jobs and technologies and skills that are associated with them. So I, I don't think so. It's not simply a matter of, of national R and D budgets that shape these things. It's a matter of uh, where we country where we invest, what what industries were were engaged in, but also what policies we set to incentivize use of labor or to incentivize uh, different types of, uh, of um, uh, growth sectors. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I see that we are four minutes before 11 o'clock. We will have a 45 minute break coming up. So with the indulgence of you, David, and the audience, several questions have come in. So if we could extend from a few extra minutes. Oh, sure, of course, of course. 11 o'clock. Uh, yeah, I apologize for speaking a little longer than I planned. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfectly fine. So there's uh, uh, several questions about the nature of the next jobs. Uh, will the next jobs, um, thinking specifically about uh, economies in low and middle income economies, will the next jobs be mainly in services and electronics, or is there a future for manufacturing? And then a related question is, how is it that these technologies have not eroded the comparative advantage of very poor countries whose main resource is unskilled labor? Okay, good. Um, so, you know, so this, I mean, I think that question sort of refers to this, you know, kind of thesis about premature deindustrialization. Will there be a manufacturing, uh, you know, opportunity for growth? I mean, look, I think, you know, China is going to be moving out of a lot of labor intensive manufacturing because it's just become too expensive there. So, you know, the question is which country will be the next China <laughs> uh, or at least, you know, will take over. And this is a, you know, Gordon Hansen has a recent essay asking this question and it's not clear, but it, it seems unlikely. It seems like there's going to be a lot. And we already see this in the case of Vietnam, for example, uh, you know, movement of uh, labor intensive work again, back out of China as it becomes a higher income country. So I think there's a lot still going to be a lot of work to go around. Although, of course, it will be done, uh, you know, with more technology and somewhat less labor. But of course, you know, overall uh, global consumption is rising as is population. Um, how is it that they have not eroded the comparative advantage of low income countries? Uh, it's a good question. And I don't have like, I don't have, a, I don't feel I can give an authoritative answer to that question. Uh, I think, but you know, uh, you know, a couple of things. I want to say first, of course, a lot of low-income countries are developing, and in some sense, their their citizens' needs are growing, their productivity is growing, and so of course, that you know, that's going to create indigenous activity. It's not all based on trade, uh, and so that rising productivity just creates the potential for uh, you know uh, uh, lo valuable uses of labor within those countries. Second, uh, a lot of this technology is portable. You know, certainly when we look at auto production around the world, it's actually rather homogeneous, uh, in, at least in, you know, yeah, it's rather homogeneous where, where cars are made. They're made using the same technologies and they don't have to necessarily be made in high income countries. Germany has outsourced a lot of its auto production to Eastern Europe. The U.S. has outsourced a lot of its auto production to Mexico. Right. Why are they doing that? Well, they just move the technology uh, to places where costs of doing business are lower. And so, you know, it does depend, of course on well-functioning institutions. It depends on some edu on educated labor, it depends on rule of law. It depends on infrastructure. All these things are necessary, uh, but uh, I think where those things exist, they can be, uh, they can be harnessed productively. Doesn't, there's no reason that they need to be done uh, in high income countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, um, ask uh, two more questions from the chat. Uh, one of those questions it has to do with relations between unions and companies. And the question is, uh, uh, in sharing the results from the increase of productivity, can this help bring back good jobs, uh, help economic growth, and decrease the enormous differences in incomes per capita across countries? Okay, so, the, the, so there are two different questions there, right? One is within country inequality and one and the other is between country inequality. So on within country inequality, 
you know, I, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that institutional forces are just as important as the technological forces and they work together. Uh, they're often, and, and so uh, I don't think that the sort of the level of inequality that we see is, you know, you could call it a market phenomenon, but it, it, that it's not that deterministic. Uh, it could have been differently. In fact, many countries have chosen to do it differently. Um, and uh, so I think, and I, I do think that restoring the voice of labor in the developed world is going to have, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the way to get leverage on that. Now, I also think demographic change and particularly the slowing population growth and the shortage of young labor will actually work in the favor of workers in the rich world. Um, in terms of between country inequality, it's a much, much harder question because I, I mean I think all of you would say more than more authoritative than me that every country is a different story and it's hard to, you know, to generalize. Obviously, the diversity of outcomes is enormous. This has been a great, you know, several decades for uh, the world's middle class, right? And uh, and I think we've seen a lot of prosperity. Uh, rising and also in all the development that we've seen in sub-Saharan Africa and the investment that's occurring there. I mean, I, you know, you may have mixed feelings about, you know, how China goes about investing in some countries, uh, although you could have mixed feelings about the, how that's happened historically from others, but but nevertheless, the investments in sub-Saharan Africa that the uh, other Western countries were not making. So, I, you know, I don't want to make a prediction about world uh, inequality and how it will evolve, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. And so I, I view this as a non-deterministic uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, set of circumstances where, uh, the choices are, the outcomes are contingent on the choices that we make. And, uh, and these are not, uh, preordained for the better or for the worse. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, one other question, uh, this one's pretty broad ranging. And so you may want to pick from with, within, uh, the points, uh, uh, this questioner asks, uh, well, says, thanks for the wonderful talk FDI flows have plateaued in the last five years or so. And at the same time, automation is leading to a repatriation of capital to OECD countries. The questioner then asks, what is the development path for developing countries that are hoping to industrialize? Will they leapfrog to services or experience early deindustrialization? Will migration flows rebalance the reversal in capital flows? Okay, so that's a super hard question. So first of all, I you know I, you you make a point that I'm not well aware of about these FDI flows. So that's something I need to read up on because that's an important fact that I uh, I didn't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I know FDI has slowed, but I didn't realize. Well, wait, let me just pause. Uh, the um, I don't know about this premature industrialization deindustrialization question. Uh, as I said, I don't think the evidence has so far strongly supported that that's occurring. But I do think if it were occurring, it's a problem. Uh, and the reason is because manufacturing has been the best sort of technology we've known for taking people without very high levels of education and putting them in jobs where they have a lot of value added. And that was kind of crucial to the development of, uh, you know, of uh, Western countries and during the, uh, the, the uh, you know, kind of mass production era. It's been true to the growth of the, the kind of Asian tigers. And, um, and so it's, it's hard to see how service-led growth uh, has those same properties, unfortunately. Um, so I share the concern, and I, you know, I again, I think there's there's an enormous amount of manufacturing going on. It still uses a ton of labor, as far as anyone knows. There's about 100 million manufacturing workers in China, although official statistics are not given on this. And uh, but China's manufacturing employment is declining. And it's not just good of automation, it's because it's moving out of sectors where it's no longer competitive. And so I think that's remains to be opportunity, but it will require investment. It will require expertise. It will require technology, but the technology doesn't just substitute people. It also complements them. It allows them to do very, uh, you know, high quality, high efficiency work, uh, you know, in many settings, in many cases requiring some specialization, but not requiring extremely high levels of formal schooling. Um, so again, I, I, you know, I'm not expert in this and I don't want to claim authority, but I think there's, I, I do not think that the kind of, uh, the, the destiny has been determined for better or for worse. Okay, on, on that note, uh, I want to thank you for uh, 
a, a wonderful talk uh, and uh, thank the audience for the questions and interest. Uh, it's now five minutes after the hour, whatever the hour is in the time zone you're in, and the next session will begin at 45 minutes after the hour. David, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, and uh, hope that Great uh, pleasure. Works of, these are some use. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.